So welcome, welcome. Let's uh, start with uh, our ECG of the week. So does anybody want to use the chat or unmute themselves and want to say something about this ECG? So it's a very normal looking ECG, isn't it? Anything that isn't quite right about it? So what do you think about the voltage of this ECG? So you can see our calibration rectangles here. And you can see that the ECG person has very kindly given us three leads. You're used to having two as a rhythm strip. It can be very helpful to have a different lead as a rhythm strip, but it's slightly confusing to have three there. But the calibration spike is the square is the, the same size as usual. So can you see that? There's not a lot of voltage going on. So very small complexes. So does anybody want to tell me what they think might be the diagnosis and what other point do I want you to make about this ECG? QT interval, we're measuring from the start of the QRS to the end of the T wave and we adjust for the heart rate. Uh, this QT interval, I can't do that mental calculation, but it doesn't look long. So if you look at consecutive ECG complexes and measure the height of the R wave, and then you line up those measurements, can you see how variable the voltage is on this. Can anybody tell me what they think the diagnosis here might be? Yes, very good. So it's likely that there's a pericardial effusion. We don't know how big, but we think it's likely that there's a pericardial effusion here. So why do we get this electrical alternance? Why do we get this variable QRS size with a pericardial effusion? Why do we get small QRS complexes generally? Why is uh, you know, some patients who have left ventricular hypertrophy on echo, don't have it on ECG. Yes, absolutely. So the, in pericardial effusion, the reason for the variation in the height of the R wave is that the heart is moving around inside the pericardial sac. And sometimes there's more fluid in the way, sometimes there's less fluid in the way. I'll show you a diagram of that in a second. And why do we see sometimes more electricity, sometimes less? It's all to do with electrical insulation. So if you have somebody who's overweight, then the adipose tissue will be insulating. If you have somebody with bad COPD or with a pneumothorax or with a pericardial effusion or a pleural effusion, all these things will affect uh, the complexes and people's body shapes. If you've got a pectus excavatum or pectus carinatum or uh, your body shape means that the ECG electrodes have to be placed slightly more laterally. Um, it, uh, it will all affect the shape of the QRS complexes. And think of it like you've got a heart, which is a pulsating ball of electricity. And the amount of electricity you see is reduced by putting it inside a torso. <clears throat> and it's further reduced if you put it inside a bigger torso. It's very rarely well, it isn't connection between the electrodes and the skin surface, because if you have a bad connect and you end up with a very noisy signal rather than a small signal, uh, it's very rarely due to infarct. Um, I've got one example of that, but you have to have such a big infarct that you wouldn't normally survive it. Uh, it can be due to things like cardiac amyloidosis, where you have uh, amyloid 
protein which uh, replaces myocardial tissue and that can reduce voltage. So think with a pericardial effusion, uh, imagine a goldfish bowl without the goldfish and think of the heart bobbling around inside there and you can immediately see if you've got an electrode over here, sometimes the heart's going to be closer, sometimes it's going to be further away from that electrode, so you get the electrical alternance. Wonderful. So let's move on to heart failure emergencies. So as uh, many of you know, heart failure is very, very close to my heart. And uh, I, I really, I, I think it's such an important area because of how much you can achieve. And because I think heart failure is a generally underloved area of cardiology. And so I very much want to change the perception that heart failure patients are like a ship going down and there's not much you can do other than rearrange the deck chairs. You know, a heart failure emergency by that uh, criteria is, you know, ship going down while on fire. But the reality is that these patients can rise from the flames of their acute presentation and do phenomenally well. Uh, simply through giving them standard treatment. Some of them get heart transplants, but you know, even people who appear to be extremely unwell in terrible heart failure or have big, big infarcts, big, big uh, amounts of, of damage that mean that there's acutely severe failure, they can actually do very, very well if you treat them well. So I'm going to talk briefly about the heart failure impact on the NHS. I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the different types of heart failure because I think there's a lot of confusion about the types of heart failure. Then we'll cover briefly, because I could spend an entire hour on it, the different medications for chronic heart failure as opposed to the acute situation. And then we're going to have two different types of heart failure emergency. Next week, uh, I'll talk to you a little bit more about what heart failure is uh, and talk about some different types of emergency situation or challenging situations that tend to affect heart failure patients. So can anybody tell me uh, the number of bed days that heart failure accounts for annually in the NHS? Any, any guesses? So the answer is 1 million inpatient bed days. So it's a big, big part of the NHS care. So of all emergency medical admissions to hospital, what proportion of them are due to heart failure? So I don't know how many different medical conditions might cause you to be admitted to hospital. There, there are a lot. Uh, but of the, all those different conditions, what proportion of those patients admitted are due to heart failure? So the answer is, oh, not 40%, thank goodness. I mean, uh, <laughs> we have non-cardiologists looking after patients. So the answer is, uh, oh, good good guess, uh, Rebecca. So 5% of, of all patients. So that's a very large, for a single condition, it's a very large proportion. And we have about 2,000 admissions a year in Leicestershire with heart failure. We uh, have quite high figures. Um, relative to uh, the, the rest of the country and the relative to the size of our, our population. And the risk of readmission and death within 60 days of this condition, how, what do you think the risk of readmission or mortality within 60 days of an admission with heart failure is? Well, the answer is that, of course, it's quite variable depending upon what series you look at, and it's quite hard to quantify, but somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. And that we strive to reduce because this is all about how well you look after the patients. If you're doing a really good job of looking after the patients, their risk will go down. But these are difficult patients to look after. Uh, they're complex uh, conditions that require lots of attention to detail. Um, and we know that patients with heart failure have a poor prognosis. This is it based on NYHA class at presentation. And you can see patients in NYHA class four. Um, sorry, this is this is outpatients, NYHA class four outpatients. They have a 30% mortality at one year. Uh, 
we can do a huge amount to reduce mortality and this is a population who are being optimally treated so we need to do that otherwise the results will be much worse and we do a national audit every year and uh, these show that as you get older patients uh, do worse they have a higher mortality rate but it also shows that depending upon whether you're under cardiology and having specialist input rather than under general medicine you can have a big difference in your mortality so does that mean that cardiologists and heart failure specialists in particular are reducing the mortality of these patients The answer to that is no, because this is an audit. It doesn't tell you causation. And so the patients who are being uncared for under general medicine may have lots of frailty issues. They may be more elderly, uh, and that might be why their mortality rate is higher. Uh, equally, the patient's mortality rate might be higher, not because they're getting older, but because they're more likely to be under the general medical team rather than under the heart failure specialists. We just don't know the answer to that but it's likely to be a combination of the two and I, I think the frailty will also have a, a big impact on something like mortality. Readmissions uh, isn't being assessed in this audit and that would be an interesting parameter to look at. So moving on let's talk about the different types of heart failure. So can you tell me or let me show them because we could spend a lot of the presentation talking over these. So I would say these are the different types of heart failure. And I say types, I'm not saying etiology because ischemic heart disease, if you have an infarct, that might cause you left ventricular systolic dysfunction. If you've got severe ischemia of part of the heart, uh, but you haven't actually infarcted the tissue, the heart muscle might not be working properly because it's not getting its blood supply. So that might cause it to be weak or it might cause it to be stiff. I say stiff because this is more complicated than just stiffness, but that's the easy way to think about it. Uh, alternatively, the ischemic heart disease might have affected the mitral valve because the papillary muscles have got actually quite big muscles and if they're not getting their blood supply the mitral valve won't close properly and you could have severe MR caused by ischemic heart disease. Uh, you could also have uh, the right uh, side of the heart being damaged by your heart attack. Relatively uncommon uh, but you can infarct the right ventricle. Um, you have to have a proximal right coronary artery uh, lesion to do it. So that's that's a relatively uncommon thing. And in, in our primary PCI era, uh, we generally unblock these and, and right ventricular failure isn't a big deal usually. Uh, but so you see how ischemic heart disease could cause all four of these. And the actual cause, much as you might say that's the, really important to know why it's happened. Well, it is, but mostly actually it's medications that make the difference and the etiology doesn't change all that much. I've been asked to explain how ischemic heart disease will cause a preserved ejection fraction again. So imagine your, um, there's a, a very simple way of thinking about it. Muscles contraction is an energetic process. So you, if you have rigor mortis, that's because all the ATP in your cells has been used up. You're obviously not producing any more, and so the muscles lock. And so if your heart isn't getting enough blood supply, the muscles aren't going to unlock. So it's going to be very, very stiff. So think of it like that. It's a, it's a bit of a crutch, but that would make the heart very stiff. And the heart is contracting okay potentially but it's not relaxing and filling very well and so it won't work well as a pump if it doesn't relax and fill because it won't have anything to pump. So heart failure of the preserved ejection fraction causes all sorts of confusion and the problem with this people say um, they've got heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction because they've got severe MR. No that's wrong 
it's valvular heart failure if you've got severe mitral valvular disease or aortic valvular disease or structural heart disease if you have a ventricular septal defect. Heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction is the idea that the heart is contracting normally uh, in the systolic bit of it, but it to, to the obvious appearance on an echo, but it's actually quite stiff and it doesn't open and fill so well. Now, to a heart failure specialist purist, that really would upset them as a description because actually it's much more complicated than that. And there are lots of components to systolic function. You have both the uh, contraction concentrically, which you see the ventricle squeezing in, that's the easy bit. You also have longitudinal shortening, so the base coming up towards the apex coming up towards the base and you also have a twisting motion and so heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction maybe actually it's some more subtle aspects of systolic dysfunction that we can't see so well um, and this is a poorly understood condition because preserved ejection fraction is hard to get in isolation it usually goes with obesity obstructive sleep apnea diabetes osteoarthritis frailty so it's a very heterogeneous group of patients to study. Uh, left ventricular systolic dysfunction is, is much clearer and this may be why a lot of the studies of treatment in heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction have been uh, negative. Uh, if you have left ventricular systolic dysfunction there are a myriad of fantastically beneficial treatments for you which I'll run through very quickly in a moment. If you have heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, medications don't do a great deal. We want to control blood pressure, we want to control arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, we don't want that to go too fast, rates between 80 and 90 are okay um, in AF, in preserved ejection fraction. Uh, we need to anticoagulate, obviously. We get patients to exercise, lose weight, control blood pressure. Um, but there are not really any disease modifying medications. Spironolactone has a limited role. Valvular heart failure, structural heart failure, if you can fix the structural problem, the valvular problem, then you can deal with it. Right heart failure is uh, generally secondary to left ventricular failure. I'll explain why in a second. And constrictive pericarditis is a completely different condition again, which is probably beyond the remit of this talk. So left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Typically what happens is your left ventricle is struggling to pump enough blood and so if it's only able to squeeze out, when you talk about ejection fractions, the amount that it squeezes out, if it can only squeeze out 30%, then a way of squeezing out more is to get bigger. And then if you have twice the volume and you squeeze out 30%, you're still maintaining the forwards flow. And the bigger it gets, the harder it is for it to work. And this vicious circle of remodeling is partly why patients deteriorate. I mean, why the heart doesn't work as an energy deficit. Why do you have to die of heart failure? Because if the patient's alive in front of you, the heart's not working in an energy deficit. You know, if only we could give the right messages, maybe we could keep things ticking along. Um, but this remodeling process, this leads slowly to, to progressive heart failure. And as the ventricle gets bigger and the flow is more and more sluggish, that means that the pressure trying to get the blood in there goes up. And so your left atrium dilates and becomes higher pressure. This has got a very thin wall. So the atrium stretches very rapidly if there's heart failure present. And that means that you've got to push harder to get the bloods out of the lungs into the left atrium. And so the right side of the heart has to work harder in order to get blood into the left side through the lungs and so the right side of the heart steadily dilates and fails and you get secondary right ventricular failure and this process happens with all the different types of uh, pathology so if you have severe aortic stenosis causing a failure you usually get hypertrophy rather than dilation in that case 
Um, but if you have the it causing left-sided heart failure, you end up with secondary right heart failure. And so often the patients who have valves fixed go on over the course of the next 10 years or so to develop progressive right heart failure because processes have started that just slowly keep on getting worse and you end up with, uh, with high pressures in the lungs and pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure causing symptoms. Um, these patients tend to follow an organ system failure trajectory and I'm sure you're familiar with this from other conditions. It's much harder to predict than something like cancer and that means that it can be really tough on patients that they seem terrible on each of these dips but you manage to get them back up on their perch by good care and then they do pretty well again and they don't really notice this slow inextorable decline. But this means that when the end comes, it tends to come uh, unexpectedly. And that uh, is very hard uh, because people are not expecting it. And you should never, when you're doing things like respect forms, uh, underestimate the fact that the person uh, may not be on the same page at all as you and may think that you've got something that you can do for them again, as you have many times before. Um, and while they're on this slow decline, you know, this, I don't like it when people say that their heart failure is stable and it's all fine, we can just carry on as we are. It's, it's always getting worse. I'm going to show you a series of trials in a moment and each of them you can see a steady decline. These patients are not really stable, they are slowly dying and you can slow down the rate that they die if you do a better job of looking after their treatment. So if you've got a reduced ejection fraction, by which I mean less than 40%, there is so much that we can do. If we look at enalapril, this is the SOLVE trial, one of the earlier trials of ACE inhibitors, you can see that there's a 50% reduction in rate of death at three months in this population of really poorly heart failure patients. So phenomenal reductions in, in risk occur very rapidly. Look how fast these curves separate. Um, if we look at patients who are taking beta blockers and ACE versus patients who aren't on beta blockers and aren't on ACE inhibitors, look at the difference in mortality between these two groups. If we look at spironolactone, uh, we can again, this is all of these are survival so far. So this reduces your relative risk of uh, mortality by 29% adding in spironolactone to, um, to standard care. If we look at adding a defibrillator in, again, there's a very substantial reduction of about 15, 20 uh, maybe 15 absolute percentage points, more like uh, 35 or so relative risk reduction, again in mortality by putting in a defibrillator. Um, cardiac resynchronization therapy, you see a similar sort of benefit. This is all cause hospitalization, death, and um, major cardio uh, hospitalization with major cardiovascular event but if you look at mortality there's a considerable improvement in mortality with cardiac resynchronization and this can mean they've got more blood pressure and they can have more medications so loads of things we can do and there's newer drugs like sacubitril valsartan and dapagliflozin and so more things coming out all the time on the other hand heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction uh, there are very limited medications for this. And if you think of it in terms of the heart muscle became, being thicker and stiffer, if you think of uh, that causing back pressure on the atrium because it has to have higher pressure to get into the ventricle, and then that in turn causes the right ventricle to fail. You don't have to have left ventricular hypertrophy with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, but you do have to have a dilated atrium. Your atrium will dilate rapidly if the pressures of filling the ventricle are high. So it wouldn't make any sense to have heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction and a normal sized atrium. So on an echocardiogram, look out for dilatation of the left atrium. That symptoms and raised NT pro BNP, so raised biomarkers point you towards 
heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. And imagine, and you have a really hypertrophied heart, just how hard it would be to get that to open. As I say, it's a bit of a crutch. It's more complicated than that, but unless you want to be a heart failure specialist, uh, if you thinking of it as stiffness of the heart is, is good enough. So that's the uh, teaching about heart failure over with. Let's get on with our emergency presentations. So case one, I like you to really feel for these patients. So just imagine this being your patient, uh, this uh, young gentleman who's uh, aged about 35. He's got a wife and two young children. Uh, you really want to help him. So he uh, actually he doesn't have a wife and children, does he? I've, I've, I'm making up the story entirely. He lives alone, but he's independent and well. Um, he's got general malaise that's been present for about two weeks and now he suddenly presents you with severe shortness of breath. Doesn't have any peripheral edema, doesn't have any significant past medical history and he's not on any medications. So nice and straightforward. His temperature is high, he's tachycardic and he's hypertensive and has a loud heart murmur and profuse bilateral crepitations. So what do you think the diagnosis is here? Any points you want to make about this gentleman? Thank you. Sorry about that. So surely uh, it, this can't be heart failure because he doesn't have peripheral edema. So endocarditis has been suggested. That's great. Pyrexia, loud heart murmur, certainly fits. But can it be heart failure if he's not got peripheral edema? So the answer to that is yes, of course it can. Uh, it can have isolated pulmonary edema or you can have leg edema without pulmonary edema. You can have both separately. It's rare for young patients to present with peripheral edema. Much more common if they present with heart failure for it to be breath symptoms of breathlessness and, uh, and pulmonary edema. So this is his chest X-ray. What do you think of that chest X-ray? So it's a fairly clear congested chest X-ray. I hope you'll agree. You can't quite see the bases here, but there may be some small pleural effusions. There isn't any cardiomegaly per se, but there are diffuse bilateral infiltrates in a, a bat swing type distribution, and this strongly points towards pulmonary edema. Also look for evidence of fluid in the fissure, look for curly B lines. Um, so what are you immediately going to do to treat this gentleman? Are you going to go for some frusamide? Are you going to give him frusamide and a nitrate? Or you want, because he's really rather poorly, frusamide, nitrates and opiates? Or will you wade in with nitrates, frusamide and non-invasive ventilation? So we've got an answer of A. We think that he'll be all right with just a bit of frusamide. Lots of people think A. So. I've not really given you enough information to make a full judgment of this. What piece of information is missing? So wide pulse pressure, that's a good point, isn't it? Why do you think he's got a wide pulse pressure, Sabrina? So that points us towards um, aortic regurgitation. 
so that's it's important to point that out. Well done. So that suggests aortic regurgitation. Aortic dissection here is not beyond the bounds of possibility because that can affect the aortic valve. But I wouldn't necessarily expect the temperature with it, to, and I would expect pain to be a major part of the presentation. But uh, it's a good thought. Um, so what bit of information is missing for you to decide if which of those treatment options is the best one? Mm, I've, I'm thinking less a specific symptom and more your assessment of the patient here. So the question is, is this gentleman going to give you time to give some frusamide and it to take its effect and you can get better or is he getting exhausted is he starting to become hypoxic uh, this is a sort of situation where a blood gas might be helpful i'm not at all a fan of blood gases if he's looking well please don't do something horrible to him unnecessarily but uh, if he's if he's looking like he might be tiring, he should be blowing off uh, his CO2, um, and uh, uh, he you know he should should not be starting to become uh, hypercapnic and hypoxic with his blood gases. He's a young gentleman, so he should be working really hard to maintain normal levels. And if he isn't, then we need to think about moving rapidly towards non-invasive ventilation to support him. Uh, but everybody in going for frusamide was right because that uh, is the guidance these days. We used to give nitrates when I was at your stage. We used to give opiates. Those can be effective, particularly the nitrate bit, but they are not first line. So how would you give the frusamide to this gentleman? Are you going to give him a stat dose of 40 and IV and then give him a bit of oral? Are you going to give him a stat dose of 80 and then 80 twice a day? Or are you going to give a nice steady infusion over 24 hours? Or do you want to give the stat dose and the big infusion? So I've got a few options of D. Everybody likes that one. Go for the uh, infusion over 24 hours of 240. Here, again, there's no clear cut right answer here because you need to assess how he responds. If you give him 80 stat IV and his chest clears rapidly, a repeat chest X-ray a couple of hours later shows the pulmonary edema is pretty much cleared, um, then 80 BDs may be a, a reasonable amount to give. This is a diuretic naive patient. He's a young patient with normal kidneys. His cardiovascular status might not be so good, which means he might not uh, make as much urine as you might expect him to. But uh, he he probably doesn't need such a big dose of frusamide and you don't want to over dry him out. So 240 to go in straight away, that is a very big dose unless he isn't responding. So I would start off with an 80 milligram IV stat dose and then I'd see how he responded to that and I might prescribe 80 BD while I'm waiting but if an hour later he isn't considerably better then maybe we need to give him another stat dose, maybe we need to follow it up with an infusion of 240. So we have to see how things go. If you weighed in too high and you overdiurese patients, then you can end up with acute renal failure caused by overdiuresis. So you have to get the balance right. There are nice guidance for the management of acute heart failure. These are really good. They're really nice and clear. And I would refer you to these to decide or to, to if, you, if you need a, 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 to know how to manage acute heart failure. So if we look through this, if you think that there's a clinical suspicion of acute heart failure, you should immediately start to treat the patient because uh, this is an emergency. If you spend the next few hours trying to decide what's going on, then he's much more likely to need invasive ventilation. So decide if they've got pulmonary edema with severe dyspnea and acidemia and then consider going in with CPAP early to support the patient while you clear the fluid. If they've got 
pulmonary edema and peripheral edema, then we should be offering an intravenous diuretic. And if that doesn't work, sometimes we can think of ultrafiltration. I've yet to send a patient for ultrafiltration. It'll happen, but it's usually giving sufficient doses of intravenous diuretic. And if that's not working, the patient's too sick for ultrafiltration to help. If they're in cardiogenic shock, that's a really tough situation. Really, really hard, uh, because if we're giving inotropes and vasopressors, we're making the heart work harder and it's already failed. Um, so that's a really tough situation. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about that with the next case. But uh, we should, if these patients uh, are in front of us, be, be thinking, do we need to do mechanical support or even transplant? And we've got very fortunate in Leicester to have be an ECMO centre. We used to be the only ECMO centre in the country. Thank goodness we weren't when uh, COVID-19 hit because it was bad enough during the swine flu, which effectively shut us down for months because all the swine flu patients came to us, the, the small numbers that got very sick. Um, if somebody has hypertension or ischemia, um, so if somebody's presenting with an acute coronary syndrome and they've got heart failure, then maybe an intravenous diuretic can be helpful in that situation. But that's that's further down the line. Um, so give a bolus or infusion, the guidelines say, a bolus to start for sure in somebody who's poorly, but followed up with an infusion if they are not responding well um, or further boluses if they are. We should think about giving a higher dose of the diuretic. Uh, the IV dose should be oral plus 50%. So if you are on uh, 40 BD of oral frusamide, that would be 80 milligrams plus 50% uh, would take us up to 120. So we might want to give 60 milligrams twice daily in those split doses adding up to 120. We don't tend to give that, so we tend to give 50 BD, 80 BD, um, 240, 24 hourly. So you'd go for the, the sort of uh, the closest to, to the oral conversion. Um, bear in mind that the diuretic dose might have been substantially increased shortly before admission, and bear in mind they might not be taking the medication. Uh, it's very important to closely monitor renal function, so hourly urine output is essential in this sort of acutely unwell patient um, and, uh, and, and daily monitoring of renal function and uh, daily weights. Uh, the advice is that we don't routinely offer opiates or nitrates, so specific situations nitrates may be helpful. We don't routinely offer opiates. Uh, and then ventilation. There's uh, clearly we don't use non-invasive ventilation in all cases, but it can be extremely helpful because the positive pressure makes it easier for the patient to breathe and can help to push the fluid back into the uh, interstitium in back then back into the, uh, the pulmonary vasculature and then out through the kidneys. So non-invasive ventilation can be very helpful. Um, and then ultrafiltration is, is an option, but only as a very much a second line option, which I would say you very rarely need to consider. So we then want to make a, uh, a diagnosis, don't we? We obviously want to give the frusamide rapidly unless we think the patient might be septic, but if they're really sick, we don't want to hang about unless it, it genuinely we don't know. Um, in which case seek senior support. But a, a BNP or now an NT pro BNP because BNPs have uh, been superseded because of uh, a drug uh, which I'll talk about next week. Uh, so NT pro BNP, uh, this is the nice guidance. We use figures here less than 200 is normal, over 2000 is probably heart failure, in between is uncertain. And it is certainly it's, it's uh, not a perfect rule in or rule out test when you're using those fine margins, but over 2000, it does become very likely to be heart failure unless the patient normally has an NT pro BMP of over 2000.
less than 200, you should certainly be looking for alternative diagnoses. And it's rule out is extremely good. So if your NT pro BNP is less than 200, it would be very unlikely that you had heart failure. Not impossible, but very unlikely. Uh, if your NT pro BNP is over 2000, it is likely to be heart failure, but it could still be other things doesn't go up so much in sepsis, but something it really does increase with is renal failure. So if you have renal failure causing fluid overload, your NT pro BMP will be sky high. And the other big, big thing is to find out how the heart's working. As we said earlier, we can make an enormous difference to our patients if they've got reduced ejection fraction with medications. Um, if they've got valve pathologies, then we need to think about urgent fixing of the valves. So critical to know what their LV systolic function is and no patient with new heart failure should leave the hospital without an echocardiogram to find out what's going on because you've got to start these treatments early to prevent this readmission rate of 30 to 50% and to stop the mortality. So case two. This time, we've got quite a different sort of a person that I want you to picture. Now, this gentleman is 55 and has had chest pain for 24 hours, during which time he's refused to see his GP, despite the urgings of his friends. And now he's come into us with severe shortness of breath. He's spent his life drinking and smoking heavily, in between working as an HGV driver, but he again doesn't have any past medical history or medications. He's apyrexial, but he's a bit tachycardic and his blood pressure is low at 85 over 50. What do you think the diagnosis is likely to be here? Great, so I've had a suggestion of ACS and MI and IHD. So can you be more specific than ischemic heart disease or acute coronary syndrome or even than myocardial infarction? So has he had an end STEMI with a troponin release of 10,000. This presentation with low blood pressure, very good. So looking for signs of cardiogenic shock. Excellent. Thank you, Emmanuel. So this sort of patient is going to be very, uh, it's going to be a very big infarct if this blood pressure is, as we suspect, Reckon my, uh, suggesting cardiogenic shock. Uh, Rebecca, you're right to think, could it be a type 2 myocardial infarction? I mean, this could be sepsis, even though he's apyrexial, that might make him higher risk sepsis. Uh, maybe this is something else entirely. Maybe he's had a big GI bleed and that's causing his tachycardia and low blood pressure. So we need to keep an open MI, uh, open mind. And if you had a troponin of about two or 3,000, then very much we'd be thinking type 2 and MI, something else has caused this. But this presentation sounds like a really big infarct uh, and unfortunately he's presenting to us late. So what what are you, are you thinking about doing for this gentleman? Any questions you want to be asking him? Any tests you want to do? So we could ask him about family history. Family history doesn't help us enormously because we are, are, are not going to change our minds about has he had an infarct or not based on the family history. Uh, troponin, uh, we want to do something before the troponin and now I've been told to do an ECG. So yes, we in any patient, the moment you think that you might be having ischemic heart, has ischemic heart disease, you need to do an ECG. So what do you think about that ECG? 
So it shows an anterior STEMI, very good. Any advance on anterior STEMI? So reciprocal changes. So we got very slight ST depression, haven't we? Uh, so a little bit of reciprocal change. Anteroceptal, yeah, there's certainly V2, it's anteroceptal. And you can see there's also elevation in one and AVL, so it's uh, anterolateral. Uh, big trouble, that's a good description of this one. Why is this big trouble? So what am I asking to tell me more than just that there's a extensive ST elevation? So the big, they're kind of suggesting you need PCI, but look at this. They're Q waves, aren't there, in V2, V3, V4, V5, and even V6. So this gentleman has also got Q waves in one and AVL, so a huge territory and a huge amount of damage looks to have been done. So how do we decide if we should send this patient for PCI? Because that's what you're recommending for me. So we're being told it's too late for PCI. Does everybody agree that it's too late for PCI? Can he lie flat? That's a consideration. Um, we can do patients on a wedge. It's very, very messy if we try and do that all round. So we do need them to be able to just about lie flat. Ah, ongoing chest pain, yes. Cocaine use, that's worth certainly considering. Um, if somebody's a cocaine user, it does affect whether or not we would want to do a PCI because it can be coronary artery spasm. Um, so I've got a number of options for you here. What would you like to do for this gentleman? I mean, he's hypotensive. Do you want to put in a central line and then we can give him boluses of IV saline until we've got his blood pressure up and got him nicely filled? Do you want to give him a bit of IV frusamide because he's breathless and you want to try and clear some fluid? Or maybe this is the moment to crack open our GTN pump and, uh, and deal with the ischemia and the heart failure. Or do you want to rush him upstairs, do a coronary angiogram? You're not sure if he can lie flat, but there's no time to lose. He's only, you know, he's had his 24 hours. We've got to get in there and deal with this and put in something called an IABP, an intra-aortic balloon pump while we're at it. Or do you want to go for the central line option, but this time you think he's sufficiently filled and give him some inotropes. So lots of different options. I've got an A, B, C and E. E and D options requested, so that's brilliant. Loads of different options. And the thing here is that the right decision depends very much on the fine detail of the patient. I would say IVGTN probably isn't going to be the right answer with that blood pressure, but the other answers, it depends a bit on the patient. So if he'd had more of a right ventricular infarct, that might be causing cardiogenic shock because of right ventricular failure. And then giving um, boluses of saline might be the right thing to do to increase right ventricular filling pressures and get more blood through the lungs. But if this is um, a big anterior infarct, it's, uh, it's likely that he's not underfilled. I haven't told you if he's got any signs of pulmonary edema. So we have not told you he's breathless. That's an important assessment. If he has got pulmonary edema, then maybe we do need to try and give him um, some frusamide. Uh, the chest pain. He's had it for 24 hours, but I've not said if it's continuous or intermittent. I've not said when the worst episode happened. Maybe he's had it for 24 hours and it got really bad half an hour ago, in which case we'd still be very much wanting to, to do the pat cath. Patients, when they're coming in with infarcts, if they have ongoing pain, that does suggest that there's territory there to salvage. However, the pain can change in nature from the acute ischemic pain to a, a more of a pericarditic type pain. You can get Dresler syndrome happens late, but you can have an early pericarditis with a full thickness MI. Uh, so the nature of the pain can change. You can ju just be left with a dull ache or you can develop more of a pericarditic type pain. And if you've got a different sort of pain, that would take us away from doing a cath. Uh, 
The presence of Q waves does suggest damaged tissue that's beyond repair, but if the tissue is electrically inactive because although it's just clinging to life, it doesn't have enough um, energy to do anything electric, it's not going to be visible. So the heart could be stunned. They, this, these Q waves could disappear and you could recover some of that R wave. Uh, so if he has ongoing chest pain uh, or you've got any doubt about matters, uh, actually getting in there and doing a cath and unblocking the arteries may be the right thing to do. But that's going to involve him lying flat for a period of time. It's going to involve giving contrast, which is like giving lots of boluses of fluid because it's very osmotically uh, active, giving contrast. So that could put him into pulmonary edema. It's not a zero risk approach. But if he's got cardiogenic shock, rather than going for inotropes, which are, are likely to flog the heart, cause more damage, we would prefer to put in a balloon pump, although the evidence base for this is actually very weak, uh, partly because it's very hard to be disciplined about not doing something if you think that it's essential. So if you've got a research study where patients are, may or may not get a balloon pump when you think they really need it, you're probably not going to recruit that patient to the trial. And if you think, eh, they might, they might not benefit from having it, then it's not surprising when you get an answer that they doesn't make a lot of difference. So balloon pumps, it's it can be hard because getting patients off balloon pumps can be very difficult and that can make decision making quite hard down the line. But that's probably the important thing for him and possibly unblocking something if we've got any suggestion that there's something salvageable there is going to be the right approach. So I would say D. So he goes to the cath lab and we find that he's got a blocked left anterior descending artery and we do an echocardiogram and we see that the ventricles dilated. It's becoming almost spherical here. This wouldn't happen that acutely. This isn't actually his scan, but he's got this thing in the apex, which is a big thrombus. So he struggles. He struggles for quite some time. Uh, he's been having a real battle keeping his kidneys perfused and uh, keeping him out of heart failure over a couple of weeks. And then you're working a night shift and he suddenly flips into this and in front of you, he starts to go grey. He's very breathless. You can't feel a pulse. What are you going to do? So what's this ECG show? So it's a narrow complex tachycardia, very good. Any advance on narrow complex tachycardia? So look at the RR intervals and the regularity. And can you see? Yes, very good. It's fast AF. So here, this is almost two squares here. This is just over one square. So it's irregularly irregular and it's fast. And he's a relatively young person who's got a fairly intact AV node. So it's conducting fast and he's abruptly decompensated. Now, when you have a patient in fast AF and heart failure, you should often think about treating the heart failure rather than the fast AF because often the fast AF is being driven by the heart failure, particularly in a, an elderly patient who might not conduct in fast AF if they weren't acutely unwell and they're only going fast because they're acutely unwell. So slowing them down isn't going to help. Getting rid of the unwell bit is what you need to be doing. Uh, but this is a young patient and this patient has gone from just about managing the sinus rhythm to being desperately, desperately poorly in fast atrial fibrillation. And remember, he's got a big clot in his left ventricle and a very weak heart. So what are you going to do? Uh, do you want to chemically cardiovert him so nice and gently to minimise the risk of that clot flying off anywhere? Do you want to electrically cardiovert him? Is he in that desperate a state that you just just risk everything and you get in there and you electrically jolt that clot somewhere and hope that it doesn't go to his brain. 
are you going to give him a bit of fruzamide? You know, he's acutely worse, but this is because he's going into heart failure. It's not the fast F at all. We just give him a bit of IV fruzamide. Maybe we can go back to bed, it being the middle of the night and we're quite tired. Um, and, and that'll do the job. Or maybe some beta blocker. Uh, maybe we can slow his heart down with some beta blocker and that'll make him better. Or what about giving him some digoxin? So digoxin will be a positive inotrope. It'll make his heart work better, if anything, and it'll helpfully slow his heart down. So I've had an answer of C. I've had an answer of D. Any other options? So does anybody want to go for digoxin, intravenous digoxin? Oh, Emmanuel wants to go for amiodarone. That's the chemical cardioversion option. So Emmanuel wants to go with A, chemical cardioversion. So Joseph has said it's within 48 hours. Well, within 48 hours is if you don't know they've got a clot in their heart. If you know they've got a clot in their heart, then the 48 hours is irrelevant. Ben Warren, is he in shock stroke chest pain? So this gentleman is going grey. He's just on his way out. He's going to be peri arrest in a, a, a few moments you don't have long to play with here sorry so is that the red? Is it the red? Is that Safia, could you mute yourself please ah i can mute you that's better so I've now had an option of B. So Ben wants to electrically cardiovert this patient. I hope that he's made sure that his medical insurance is fully paid up. Emmanuel said if peri-arrest is the case, shock is the guidance. I'm not sure the guidance says shock a patient who's got a, a left ventricular thrombus. Can we do that? Are we justified? Can we not just give some digoxin, slow the patient's rate and all will be well? Or maybe we're better off giving the amiodarone and, and chemically cardioverting him. So you can't, can't, can't be sure. It might be a very thready, weak pulse. He's, uh, he's, he's getting sleepy. His GCS is dropping. You know, can, can you make a decision? What are we going to do? Does nobody want to go for digoxin? So the one answer here that is wrong for sure, well, there are two, I suppose, that are really wrong, are, are fruzamide and digoxin. Uh, so he's not gone into pulmonary edema because he was, uh, he's just very acutely gone into the fast AF and uh, you know, the story is of cardiogenic shock rather than of pulmonary edema. So you don't want to give him fruzamide, which will drop his blood pressure further. IV digoxin, you have to give about half a litre of fluid with IV digoxin. It's got a fantastic oral bioavailability. Obviously not if you're too sick to take anything by mouth, but digoxin works well in frail elderly patients controlling their heart rate at rest. It doesn't work well with exercise, and this is a situation where there'll be a lot of adrenaline floating around his system because he's in cardiogenic shock and his body will be desperately trying to say, uh, increase my blood pressure. So digoxin won't do anything other than give lots of fluid. Chemical cardioversion uh, will take too long here. So I think our options are, do we give IV beta blocker, which given he's peri-arrest is quite brave. Uh, Esmolol is quite good in these situations because it's got a half-life of a few seconds. So if you are making him worse, you can stop that and go for another option. Uh, but it all depends upon the patient. If you think you've got a little bit of time to play with, maybe a beta blocker can be helpful. But here, this is a situation where you phone up a friend and get somebody else to agree that this is the right course of action. And then you have to go for an electrical cardioversion and risk that thrombus going somewhere. Because unless you do that, you're going to lose the patient. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, and he uh, went back into sinus rhythm. I gave him some IV amiodarone at the same time, which can drop blood pressure, but I needed that so that he stayed in sinus rhythm once I'd electrically cardioverted him. And the patient actually did, did well after that. So uh, summary of all that, uh, initial treatment of patients in pulmonary edema or fluid overload is to clear the fluid overload. And you can do that by giving 
oral dose of frusamide plus 50% given IV if they're unwell enough to need hospitalization. If they're well enough to have oral frusamide, then please think about referring to the heart failure team. We can see these patients within a few days of discharge. Um, so send them home within 24 hours and we can pick them up. If you keep them in, then I'm afraid we can't. So they, if you think that they can go home and have oral diuretics, please involve us and we'll help you with that. Um, if they're not responding, then, or particularly if they're tiring, think about respiratory support, think about uh, more doses of frusamide. Uh, daily use and ease, fluid balance and weight to assess progress. Echocardiogram on all of these patients, unless there's a very good reason not to, by which I mean if they're known to have severe LV impairment and you don't see any reason that they would have developed a new valve pathology or pericardial effusion or something else that you'd beautifully diagnose with an echocardiogram, maybe you can get away without a repeat. But any new heart failures, or if you've got chronic heart failure, why is it newly decompensated? Maybe something has changed. So most patients should be getting an echocardiogram. If they have reduced ejection, left ventricular ejection fraction, there are some fantastic, really good prognostic medications that we critically need to think about starting. And we'd have to spend quite a lot of time talking more about how we go about doing that. But the important thing is that you know about it and you feel the need to be doing that and involving help with that where you're not sure. Um, and when these patients go home, we can do a tremendous amount to support them through the community heart failure team, which we've got a superb team in Leicester, both hospital based and community based, and we should be looking at heart failure rehabilitation. Fantastic. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions?